Jennifer Harris grew up in Bonham, Texas, and was adored by her community. She was described as lively, animated, and down-to-earth. After high school, Jennifer earned a bachelor's degree of science in nutrition from Stephen F. Austin University, and this is where she first met her friend, James Hamilton. In 1996, Jennifer would marry her high school sweetheart, Rob Holman. She and Rob had met in elementary school and grew up together and dated throughout their adolescence. The couple then bought a home in the suburbs of Dallas in 1999. Although Jennifer enjoyed the big city life, Rob missed the slower pace of rural Bonham. Meanwhile, Jennifer and her friend and fellow student James Hamilton would open up a massage and wellness center together in Frisco, Texas. At some point, Rob wanted to return to Bonham, and the couple would divorce. Jennifer and James began seeing each other romantically, despite James living with his pregnant girlfriend and their child. James wanted to marry Jennifer, but like her marriage to Rob, their relationship was rocky, and Jennifer declined his marriage proposals. Their massage business failed, and since the loans and debts were in her name, she was forced to file for bankruptcy, leading to her and James splitting. In March 2002, down and defeated Jennifer moved back to Bonham and moved in with her grandmother. She was only back in Bonham for six weeks when tragedy struck. After moving back to Bonham, she and Rob reconnected despite him having a girlfriend. On Mother's Day, May 12, 2002, Jennifer wanted to spend time with Rob, but because it was Mother's Day, he wanted to spend time with his girlfriend, which allegedly upset Jennifer. About a month earlier, Jennifer had told him she was pregnant with his child, but he didn't believe her. Unable to be with Rob, Jennifer went to hang out at her friend Christy Farr's house. When she left Christy's house at 8 p.m. in her green Jeep, she never told her where she was headed. Rhonda Fitzwater had a routine of walking her dog on a nightly basis, but on this night, something strange stuck out to her. She noticed a green abandoned Jeep on the side of the road near Lake Bonham Hoedown on CR 2610. Then, on May 14th, two days later, with the Jeep still in the same location, she called the sheriff's office and reported it. The police soon discovered that the Jeep belonged to Jennifer. A search ensued over the next six days until finally, a fisherman found Jennifer's body floating in the Red River on May 18th, 2002, badly decomposed. Blue marl mud was found on Jennifer's body, which is rare and only found in a few places on that part of the Red River. Her death was ultimately classified as a violent homicide, and it was so bad that her uterus had somehow been removed. Investigators determined that she was murdered before being dumped in the river as no water was in her lungs. On May 15th, police questioned Rob Holman and James Hamilton, but they both denied seeing her on May 12th. Suspiciously, on the same day she went missing, 200 yards from where her body would ultimately be found, a cottage was discovered burned to the ground. Investigators at the time believed Jennifer met her killer at the cottage, and the cottage was set on fire to destroy evidence of her murder. James had an alibi and said he was at McDonald's with a friend 50 miles away and even took a lie detector test and passed. However, Rob agreed to take a polygraph test, but never did. Jennifer had not only told Rob she was pregnant, but had also confided in at least one friend. So it's safe to say that Jennifer's uterus and other body parts missing really shocked the examiner and investigators. Rob reported that he had last seen Jennifer a month earlier near the Bonham Drive-In Movie Theater, but said there was no evidence that Jennifer had been pregnant. Forensic examiners in Dallas concluded that turtles and fish had destroyed her missing body parts during her six days in the Red River. Due to the decomposition, an exact cause of death could never be determined, but investigators did have Jennifer's laptop computer and her clothing. Jennifer's case quickly went cold, while rumors about her murder in Fannin County fired up. There was also an unsubstantiated rumor about the district attorney being involved in the crime, leading to the DA losing his job. 
In 2003, Deborah Lambert saw a news report about Jennifer's unsolved murder and reported to police that she saw a girl with reddish-brown hair on the banks of the Red River with three men while driving across the bridge with her mother at 5 p.m. on Mother's Day 2002. According to Deborah, two of the men had a hold of Jennifer's elbows and it looked like she was trying to get away from them, but the men were restraining her. Deborah said she made eye contact with the girl who looked terrified. Unfortunately, Deborah did not report the incident at the time of the sighting because she was too afraid to get involved. Also, Deborah's account does not fit in with the investigator's timeline. The police received another tip from a person who said that around the time of Jennifer's disappearance in May, he had seen a local Bonham resident standing near the Red River with two garbage bags. The tipster even mentioned that the man had a van and quickly sped away after he was spotted. The police, however, claimed that they had no way to confirm the story. In 2004, the Texas Rangers investigated Jennifer's murder. They showed Deborah a photo lineup of the men she saw with the girl, and she identified Rob Holman. On the advice of his attorney, Rob did not speak with the Texas Rangers, and the Rangers suspended their investigation in 2005. Their official report says no physical evidence, a specific cause of death, or credible witnesses link any particular person as a suspect. Daryl Parker began working on Jennifer's case in 2011 as a lieutenant in the Fennin County Sheriff's Office and excavated the foundation where the cottage burned down and its well and found blue marl mud. In 2016, Mark Johnson ran for Fannin County Sheriff and promised Jennifer's father, Jerry Harris, that he would find Jennifer's killer and renew Jennifer's investigation. Mark took office in 2017 and reopened Jennifer's case. However, due to the lack of experience and training of officers in 2002, the evidence was found to have been mishandled. On top of that, Jennifer's laptop and clothing were found to be missing from the evidence. The rest of the evidence from Jennifer's investigation was stored in pods on the sheriff's property but was destroyed by water leaks in the pods. In 2017, Joe Mara, a private investigator and CBS News consultant, was hired and believed the original investigation into Jennifer's murder was extremely weak. He worked with Sheriff Mark Johnson, and they were able to put together circumstantial evidence, but sadly no physical evidence. Joe believes the caretaker's cottage was not the scene of Jennifer's murder because a fire of that magnitude would have attracted too much attention and Jennifer's body was not discovered when the cottage burned down. He also believes the photo lineup with Deborah Lambert was not conducted correctly, but the Texas Rangers will not comment on an unsolved case. In 2017, Barry Wernick, husband of Jennifer's younger sister, Alyssa Wernick, began production on a TV miniseries documentary that is now in post-production called Justice for Jennifer. Attorney and filmmaker Barry Wernick sought justice for his wife's sister by accompanying his father-in-law and a former detective in exploring the small-town police department and rural county sheriff's office's botched investigation. The Harris family, the city of Bonham, Fannin County, and all of the investigators, past and present, have theories, persons of interest, suspects, and witness testimonies, which lead to different conclusions. However, 15 years after her murder, Fannin County Sheriff Mark Johnson named her ex-husband, Rob Holman, and her ex-business partner, James Hamilton, suspects in Jennifer's murder. According to Jennifer's father, two months after her murder, Rob asked about a life insurance policy. While Jennifer's case heated up from 2017 to 2019, it is now on ice again and remains unsolved as of December 2022. Juan Leon Laurelis was born on January 3, 1966, the youngest of nine children in the small town of Brownswood, Texas. Leon was described as quiet and shy and grew up caring for his aging parents. 
He attended Brady High School and played the trumpet in the school band. He was very close with his niece, Arlene Harbison, and the two were close in age. By the age of 30, Leon was still a shy person, a gentle giant teddy bear, a kind soul who loved to cook and dance and bring joy to people. He was very caring and giving and would always buy his co-workers birthday and Christmas gifts and take them out to eat. He lived with his brother, George, and was mostly a homebody when he was not at work. Leon began caring for his cousin, Arlene's children, daily while working at a Kroger grocery store at night. Leon was a gay man, but kept that a secret because Brownswood was a very small, Christian, conservative town and was generally unacceptable of homosexuals, as was most of his Catholic family. In early May of 1996, Leon confided in his sister and cousin that a highway patrol officer had threatened to kill him if he was seen with his daughter again. He also shared with his sister that brothers Billy and William Gatlin had also been harassing him but claimed he didn't know why. Since Leon had not come out even to his family, it's speculated that it wasn't the officer's daughter he wasn't allowed to be with, but maybe his son. On May 9, 1996, Leon left for work before midnight in his 1988 Thunderbird. When he arrived to work that night, someone parked next to him. Then Leon's car was seen leaving the lot along with the other car. This would be the last time Leon was ever seen alive. He would be found 30 minutes later near a rifle range next to his car, which had been set on fire. He had tragically been shot execution style, six feet in front of his black Thunderbird, right in front of a rifle range fence, about 30 feet from the entrance. It's believed that he was abducted and taken to the location where he was murdered. There were possibly two assailants, one who went with him in his car and one who followed in the getaway vehicle. Authorities would later learn that at 12.15 a.m., two 911 callers passing by reported a car on fire as they passed a secluded rifle range on Farm to Market Road 2126, just outside of Brownswood. An unknown witness would also tell police that they saw a late 1970s Ford model truck with tinted windows, chrome mirror, flatbed or no bed, and a gooseneck trailer hitch. Emergency services responded within minutes and found Leon on the ground in front of his car. However, the sheriff's department immediately recused themselves from the investigation due to a conflict of interest. Was this because the highway patrol officer involved in the initial investigation was the same person threatening Leon? Interestingly, Groner Pitts, the local undertaker responsible for Brownswood autopsies, happened to also own the rifle range where Leon was found. He was also seen at the crime scene that night. Well-known private investigator William Deere took on the case but quickly quit after having his life threatened. To this day, he has never turned over the file to the family. Leon's family also questioned whether or not an autopsy was ever performed and have never received a report. Throughout the years, police followed some new leads and even had a new person of interest, but that person committed suicide in 2014. It is possible that Leon was murdered due to his sexual orientation and was possibly covered up due to the corruption within the sheriff's department. There have never been any solid leads on the case, no suspects, only one person of interest that we know of, and very little publicity. Leon's parents and all but two of his siblings have since passed away. In 2020, the case was reopened, but there are still many questions surrounding the investigation, and as of December 2022, this case remains unsolved. Kristen Leah Wilson was the middle daughter of parents Barbara and Bob Wilson. At the age of 29, Kristen was living in an apartment on Meadow Glen Lane in Houston, Texas. She had just started her business as a secretary working for small local businesses. 
She was also preparing to move to a safer neighborhood after an incident made her feel very unsafe. That incident involved a maintenance man at her apartment complex who had let himself into her apartment unannounced. On Thanksgiving Day, November 28, 1996, Kristen was supposed to meet her family for Thanksgiving Day dinner in Katy, Texas, but would never arrive. She was last seen at work the day before Thanksgiving and had stopped by the grocery store afterward to buy food to cook for the family gathering the next day. After several hours passed and she still had not arrived at her grandparents, her parents drove to her apartment. When they arrived, they found her front door unlocked. They entered the apartment and began calling their daughter's name. Her father was the first to find Kristen's deceased body lying face up on her bedroom floor. It appeared that she had just arrived home before being attacked. She had been strangled, was partially nude, and may have even been sexually assaulted. Investigators say she fought her attacker and broke several fingernails in the process. Her attacker also either ripped or cut her top off. She was found with her legs crossed at the ankles and her hands laying in her lap like someone had positioned her. Evidence indicated that someone had broken into her apartment before she arrived and waited for her. Detectives say the killer had likely arrived before Kristen had gotten home from the grocery store. They believe the person let themselves into her first floor apartment by reaching through a cat door in Kristen's screen window and by removing the window frame. The Houston Police Department investigated extensively and Texas Rangers joined the investigation. Police say the person cut her phone cord and unscrewed light bulbs, making sure the apartment stayed dark had Kristen tried to turn the lights on. Nothing was stolen from her apartment and it is believed that Kristen knew her killer and some close to her think they know who that killer is. At the time, two men in her life submitted their DNA weeks after her murder and were cleared as suspects. But the DNA technology used was in its very early stages and has since gone through many advancements over the years. Detectives also discovered that not all the evidence collected from the crime scene was tested, so there is hope that new advancements and further investigation will lead to her killer's identity. Kristen's diary and photographs revealed secrets even her own family didn't even know, such as secret relationships. In mid-2022, over 25 years after her murder, authorities increased the reward money in her case from $3,000 to $6,000 in hopes of someone coming forward. But as of December 2022, this case remains unsolved. Linda Ann Maggie was born on September 21, 1951, in New York. At the age of 55, Linda was living at 506 Franklin Street in Fredericksburg, Texas. She was the owner of the Peasant Kitchen and was described as a very spirited person, well-liked by many who also felt she had a kind, giving heart. In her spare time, Linda worked on her farm where she raised horses, goats, and sheep, and was very much active in her church. On May 14, 2007, Linda returned home from yoga class at about 5.30 p.m. Over two hours later, authorities were called by neighbors who saw Linda's house on fire. There, they discovered her body severely burned, lying face down under a large amount of debris that had fallen from the ceiling. She had stab wounds and blunt force injuries on her head and neck. A knife was found in the living room where an accelerant is believed to have ignited the fire. Her underwear was down around her knees, but there were no signs of a sexual assault. The killer left behind a large sum of money, but Linda's cell phone and wallet were never located. Two past incidents of possible interest involving Linda occurred in the years before her murder. First, on September 3, 2003, Linda had called 911 to report that a suspicious white male in his 50s named Frank, whom Linda met through a mutual friend, followed her home and was on her property and was making her feel very uncomfortable. 
Then, over two years later, on February 12, 2006, Linda reported that two of her bottle-fed sheep had been shot. It was later determined that the sheep had been shot with a 22 caliber rifle. The investigation then turned to Linda's ex-husband of 30 years, Fred Maggie. The night Linda was killed, Fred says he was nearly 100 miles away in Austin, and credit card receipts put him at a yoga studio. However, they were unable to verify whether Fred had swiped the credit card himself or if someone else had done it for him. Also, officers processing the scene found Fred's DNA at the house, and he failed two polygraph tests. To complicate the investigation even more, Fred died in 2013. As of December 2022, no one has ever been arrested for the murder of Linda, and this case remains unsolved. Maria de Lourdes Paul was born on March 4, 1945, and went by the nickname Lulu, Luli, and Laura. On June 22, 1970, at the age of 25, Maria would marry John Paul, and they would have six children together. In 1978, the Paul family moved from Florida to El Paso, Texas. Two years later, in 1980, 35-year-old Maria and her family were living at 152 Holgan Road in Vinton, Texas. Their oldest child was living in Georgia, but the other five children were still young, with the youngest under a year old. On August 1, 1980, Maria and her husband had gotten into a fight. To cool off, he claimed that she told him she was taking the bus to Anthony, New Mexico to go grocery shopping because, at the time, she didn't have her driver's license and the bus was her typical mode of transportation. However, Maria never returned and was reported missing eight days later. After going missing, her oldest daughter returned home from Georgia to care for her five younger siblings. Three months after Maria vanished, John was granted a divorce and remarried in the summer of 1981. Due to how quickly the divorce went through, it's possible they were already going through a divorce when she disappeared. There was never an investigation, merely a missing person report until the case was reopened in 2000. There must have been probable cause because authorities obtained a search warrant and the family home on Holgan Road was excavated, but no evidence was found. Her children do not believe their father had anything to do with her disappearance. Maria is described as a devoted mother who would have never abandoned her children. Fingerprints and DNA are available, but as of December 2022, Maria has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Stephanie Joy Hill was born on August 15, 1980. She played tennis in school and competed in the choir and would graduate from Permian High School in 1997 at only 16 years old. She was described as confident and intelligent and came from an all-around good family. At the age of 19, Stephanie was a student at Texas Tech living in the Indiana Village Apartments in a somewhat isolated area in Lubbock, Texas. She had talked about becoming a family and children's therapist and was on the path to graduate in 2001 with a bachelor's degree and had plans to earn her master's. On Memorial Day weekend in 2000, her friends had left town to either go on vacation or to travel home to spend the summer with family, but Stephanie decided to stay behind and work. On May 29th, she left work at Outback Steakhouse around 12.15 a.m., she spent the 12-mile drive home talking to her friend Heather. This would be the last time anyone would communicate with Stephanie. Not long after arriving home, neighbors reported smoke coming from Stephanie's apartment. That's when investigators found Stephanie's burned body. Her cause of death was blunt force trauma and possible strangulation. While the fire had burned some of the evidence, it had left enough intact for investigators to collect. The door latch to her apartment was defective, so it was unclear whether there was any forced entry. 
A neighbor reported seeing a man wearing a baseball cap, dark shirt, and brown shorts or pants leave Stephanie's apartment just before seeing the fire. He was described as white, about six feet tall, and weighed about 200 pounds, but to this day, he has never been identified. During the investigation, it was learned that about a month before her murder, a report was filed with the Lubbock Police Department that Stephanie and her friend Heather were possibly dealing with a stalker. Stephanie's car had also recently been keyed, and the window was broken out. By all accounts, she had never had a serious boyfriend and had no known enemies. If she was being stalked, it makes sense that her killer would have known that Stephanie's roommate was out of town and Stephanie would be all alone in the apartment. Authorities believe that Stephanie knew her killer, but no suspect has ever been named. And as of December 2022, this 22-year-old case remains unsolved.